in understanding this passage. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for bringing each and every one of us uh, here this evening. Lord, we pray that um, as we focus on your word, as we um, reflect on it, and as we um, do that, Lord, you change our hearts. Please help us to be um, comforted and encouraged and shaped by this passage as we grow in our love of you. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's read uh, Revelation 3, uh, verses 7 to 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven. And my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says the churches. Well, we're back in Revelation this evening and looking at the sixth letter from Jesus to this group of churches. And the church in Philadelphia looks a lot different to lots of these other churches we've seen. Jesus has uh, very little to condemn them for, uh, and it's very reminiscent of the church in Smyrna. Um, Jesus praises them for continuing on uh, in their faith. Despite the difficult circumstances that they are in, they have dug their roots deep into Christ's word and have been continuing on in their faith. This church is held up as an example to follow for us as modern day Christians. This church needs the reminder to keep holding on hope. They're encouraged by looking at Christ who holds them fast and is the one who has told them that the kingdom of heaven is open for them. The church in Philadelphia is also uh, reminded of the future rewards which will uh, be awaiting them. And this is the same application uh, for us today. We are to be excited to hold on to Christ because these promises are ones made to us. We're reminded, hold fast to Christ and endure as we're comforted and await the promised rewards. And that brings us to our three points uh, this evening, and they can be found on the handout or on the screen to my, to my left. The passage shows us three key things uh, about Jesus. Firstly, it shows us the sovereign Lord who holds his church fast. Secondly, it shows us the church which is holding fast. And thirdly and finally, these verses show us the glorious future which helps us to hold fast. So firstly, this evening, let's look at the sovereign Lord who holds us fast. Our house back in Northern Ireland used to have an absolutely rubbish door. It didn't perform its function well at all. Uh, it was uh, an old wooden door warped and stiff after years of being battered by the elements. That meant it was uh, very difficult, almost impossible to open. And when you were trying to close it, you had to shove all of your weight against it and pray that it stayed in place. And when we got the door replaced, the result was night and day. You could actually open and close the thing firstly. I was reminded about this, when I was thinking about this passage, I was reminded of, of the door because if a door can't open or close, it's pretty useless. It becomes a real problem. In this letter to the Philippian church, Jesus comforts uh, the church by reminding them of his sovereignty over the kingdom of heaven. He describes himself in verse seven, if you'll read along with me, as the holy one, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. 
Christ is the one who powerfully controls who enters the kingdom of heaven. And this provides real comfort for this weak church. Throughout Revelation so far, we've seen a ton of references to the Old Testament, uh, their prophecies and, and scriptures there, and this passage is no different. Uh, verse 7 is a direct um, reference to Isaiah 22, 22, which uh, I'll read out. It says this, And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. This is drawing a particular parallel between um, the steward of the house of David, a guy called Eliakim, and Christ. Isaiah goes on to say then in chapter 26, verse 2, that the righteous nation which keeps faith may enter in. This reference is basically saying that Christ is the one who holds the keys to the door of the kingdom of heaven. He is the one who allows access to eternal life not just people in the community surrounding this church. And that's exactly what was going on in that reference in verse nine, the synagogue of Satan is being referenced. It's very similar to a reference we find earlier in Revelation, whenever we're looking at the church in Smyrna. So we know that this isn't some anti-Semitic rhetoric, but it's instead referencing those who think that they are safe from the wrath of God, the, the people who are deceiving themselves and others. These people in this synagogue of Satan, they think they're in the welcomed family of God himself when really they shun and push away the ones who are, the ones who are really holding on to the scriptures. They push the Christians out of the synagogue, shut the door and throw away the key. They say to themselves, how dare they presume that God loves them? and not us. This would have been so genuinely disheartening for the believers in the community here in Philadelphia. Just imagine what this was like. Put yourself in their shoes for a moment of these first century believers. While the rest of your family is able to be in community with each other, all your old friends hanging out, and you've been kicked out and ostracized removed from this community because you really believe that you are keeping God's commands. The synagogue was such a dominant cultural figure and to be told, not only are you not welcome through the doors, but anyone who associates with you will have the same treatment. Well, the doors to the synagogue were firmly shut to the church in Philadelphia. And so to hear the words of Jesus himself telling this church that they are welcomed in. Well, what an encouragement that must be. It's the Lord Jesus himself who allows us access into the kingdom of heaven. Christ holds the church fast because he is the one who has opened this door to the kingdom of heaven for them. What a great amount of comfort that gives the Philadelphian church. Their families and communities may have rejected them and cast them out from society but Christ hasn't. He knows them and he keeps them and he welcomes them and he loves them. They may have lost their citizenship and their sense of belonging here on earth, but Christ assures them that their citizenship is in heaven. Now, this may seem a little foreign to us here in St. Andrews. We don't have a synagogue uh, who is ostracizing Christians and, and saying they need to be kept out for what they believe. But actually, this hits a lot closer to home when we realize the synagogue was of huge cultural significance. That's where all socializing was done, where families met together. It was its own community. And so it's actually very similar to a lot of the cultural communities surrounding us. Perhaps it is similar to the university here in St. Andrews or, say, the golf clubs or perhaps our jobs that we do, perhaps even our own families. So we can be reminded as well that when we feel rejected from this world or when the world feels like it's pushing us away, when we feel this real sting of um, being pushed out of uh, our friendship circles or being told we take the Bible too seriously, when we feel like we just want to give up on the Christian walk because we just don't feel like we have it in, it, uh, in us any longer, we remember, we're reminded that Christ has welcomed us into his kingdom. We're confident 
of our position because we look at Christ. He is the one who holds us steadfast. He has welcomed us in. And this brings us on to point two. This evening, Revelation 3 shows us the example of a church who has been holding fast to Christ. And the big application here is simple. We should be like this church and be encouraged by it. We are to hold fast to Jesus and to be inspired to continue holding fast until that very final day. This church is very reminiscent of building a house. If you've ever spent much time on building sites, uh, you'll know that the uh, first thing which must be done is to fill in the foundations. You're getting two for two here on uh, my home illustrations. So congratulations, you guys. Uh, Because in Northern Ireland, a few years ago, we were building our house that I grew up in, and we had to have rather unique foundations. Um, The land that we were building on was essentially a marsh. uh, And so we had to dig really deep roots into the ground. And this is a very similar situation here to the church in Philadelphia. They had dug their roots deep into Jesus. And so that has helped them to endure and to hold fast. So far, this church has been holding fast. And verse 11 reminds us that they need to continue that, ensuring that nobody steals, uh, steals what they have from them. That is their salvation. Uh, we need to make sure that we hear this right. This letter isn't being written to a church who are at a juncture where they need to make the decision to follow Christ or not. It's not a letter of rebuke or a correction. If you think of it in terms of your phone, they're, they're not at the low power mode of 20% or 10%. They're more similar to, to 50 or 40%. They're feeling weak. They, they need a loving reminder to continue to hold fast to Christ's word and to continue to share the gospel with those in the community around them. I think it's important that we pause for a second and consider what holding fast for this church looks like. Despite the weakness in the community, the church has stood firm in their faith. They've held allegiance to Christ, but publicly proclaimed his name. That's what holding fast looks like. They continue walking the cross-shaped life, even when it's difficult, and they've felt weak. All throughout this passage, we see glimpses of uh, how this church is doing. Uh, Verse 8, I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Verse 10, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. These verses reveal an inspiration of a church. A church who's been set through night of church building after church building. A church who's mocked and scorned in public places for holding these beliefs. Perhaps they're reminded by friends and family alike. They take their faith too seriously. They take the Bible too seriously. A group of people who are whittled down and embarrassed by those surrounding them. And yet, they hold on. Despite difficult circumstances, Jesus himself is commending this church for all that they're doing. They haven't abandoned Christ. They haven't stopped working at putting sin to death, both publicly and privately. They haven't stopped sharing their faith. This church continues on in non-conformity to the world around it. And Jesus himself holds them up as an example for us. And I, I look around the room and I think about conversations I've had with people in the congregation And we know for a fact there are folks here who are struggling today because um, of what's going on, because of what they believe. They're going through really difficult times. There are some people here whose families have rejected both them and the gospel. There are some who here today whose work and school life, it's just really exhausting to be a Christian in. Yet you keep going. You keep taking Christ's word seriously, following him, killing sin, speaking of him. In the time after church, how encouraging would it be to ask and pray for one another as we um, hear where it's most difficult to be a Christian? I'm sure there'd be many people here today encouraged by that. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged and look at the commendation this church gets. We hold fast to Christ, seeing this church as our example. They have continued to uphold Christ's commands amongst their weakness, and we are to do the same. 
And so this brings us to our third and final point this evening, because this passage tells us about the glorious future which is to come, and that helps to hold the church fast. This passage doesn't just instruct the church in Philadelphia to grin and bear through the tough times they are facing, but instead it points them towards the beautiful reward which will be given if they hold fast until Christ returns. Jesus uses these promises, uh, these future promises, to spur on the Christians in the moment to hold fast to him and continue walking in light of Christ's word and proclaiming his name. One really helpful quote I came across when I was working on this sermon was from Warren Wiersbe. He said this, nothing paralyzes our lives like the attitude that things can never change. We need to remind ourselves that God can change things. Outlook determines outcome. If we see only the problems, we will be defeated. But if we see the possibilities in the problems, we can have victory. Christ is reminding his church um, to plant their eyes firmly on him and the victory that he will bring in the final days. And so we see three promises made to the Philadelphian church. And they shape and frame how they're able to carry on. And so how we are able to carry on. Firstly, they receive vindication before their foes. That's in verse uh, nine. Uh, they receive deliverance in the final period of testing. And thirdly, they have security in the coming age. So let's have a look at those each individually now. Firstly, Jesus promises the church in Philadelphia they'll have vindication over their foes. Verse nine says, behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Not only will the synagogue of Satan, those who had closed their doors earlier to the Christians in Philadelphia be conquered by Christ, they'll also bow down to the persevering Christians. So through all the, the social shunning, through all the mockery and scorn thrown towards this church, Jesus reminds them that they will be vindicated. They will have victory over their foes. The members of the synagogue of Satan who think they are safe because they have the, the temple or because they abide by certain rules and regulations will be made to see that Jesus doesn't love them. In fact, he will bring them to realize that Jesus loves those who have been ousted from this synagogue. This point might be a little difficult for us to get our heads around here in the West, but I was reminded of the Christians in, in Afghanistan and in China and in all of the places where people are locked up for proclaiming the name of Christ. Just think of how good news this is to them, that when Christ returns on the final day, when they hear that final trumpet blast, they know he's coming back to deliver them to safety. When Christ comes, it will be expressly clear who his people are. The believer will be exalted in the presence of their enemies. And this doesn't just apply to Christians who are being um, locked away in prison. It, it hits home here in Scotland, here in St. Andrews. Because on that final day, Jesus will publicly exalt those who follow him, the faithful ones. He will humble those who have mocked his people. Again, that idea of people who say that they take the Bible too seriously will be proved wrong and shown the fullness of Christ on that final day. So we take comfort in knowing that Christ recognizes our trials for him and promises that one day things will be different and that there will be victory for those who continue. Secondly, then, Christ promises deliverance in the final period of testing. Read with me verses 10 and 11. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Jesus promises to keep his church safe if they remain holding fast to his word and proclaiming him to continue on doing what they're doing. There's an important reminder in these verses, however, that Christ is coming back soon. He will judge the entirety of creation. And so we need to remember that. Share the gospel for those who don't know it yet. 
because Christ is coming back and he will judge. And for those Christians who are going through real felt suffering and persecution today, there's great comfort that this is only for a short time. Christ will return soon. And we can know that Christ uh, will keep us from this hour of trial as well. Thirdly then, and finally, Christ promises that the church will be secure in the coming age. Verse 12 says this, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Christ promises that if the church remains rooted in him, then the final result of his loving care will that this church of little power will be established as an immovable pillar in the temple of the heavenly Jerusalem. This idea of writing the name of God on believers comes up again later on in Revelation. And this is essentially the promise that the people who belong to God are known by him and kept by him and loved by him. Christ's tender promise to those who are painfully aware of the weakness and insecurity is that they will finally belong. And so this is true for us today. We are reminded that we too will belong so long as we continue in endurance. We finish the race not by hunkering down and weathering trials in life, but by trusting in the promises of Christ and thus holding fast to him. This passage gives us deep encouragement that we worship a sovereign saviour who holds us fast. During times of hardship, when we feel really weak and pushed out, we delight in knowing that Christ is the God who holds us fast. And so we imitate this holding fast, just as the Philadelphian church has modeled to us today. And finally, we look to a glorious future where we'll be delivered by Christ. And so spurs us on to finish the race set out for us and endure until Christ's ultimate and final coming. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us this evening. Lord, please help us to know these future promises, to reflect them in the way that we live our lives. Lord, help those of us here today who feel really weak, those of us who are tired and who need encouragement. Lord, please might you grant us that. Help us to be spurred on in walking uh, in your ways and walking this cross-shaped life. Father, we thank you for um, all that you have done so far, that you are the glorious Lord who holds us fast. So Lord, help us please this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well.